Good morning, Professor. Good morning. How are you? Or good evening. <laughs> How is your family? Uh, so, so, Professor. Everything all right. Your children must be uh, getting quite uh, old. Yes, uh, one is uh, seven years old and the other is uh, five years old, Professor. Well, wonderful, wonderful time of, uh, of family life at that age. Is. Yeah, uh, today because of uh, COVID-19, they all uh, uh, stay, at, stay at home and uh, learning online. <laughs> ah. Welcome to, uh, to our get together today. We have some very interesting cases that I hope will be useful to you. And uh, we look forward to uh, um, having this hour together. Please, uh, if you have questions, um, please uh, either you know, type them into the chat or uh, um, otherwise uh, save them. And we'll sort of have a couple of pauses for those uh, um, those uh, to, to discuss the questions. Welcome, Dr. Chung, and congratulations to you on your uh, scholarship for the uh, uh, USCAP meeting next spring. We're very pleased to see that. Thank you very much, Professor Lewitt. Yes. I'm very happy to receive the rain. Yes, we hope that we can, uh, we can see you while you're here. All right, so I'm going to, yes. I'm going to open the first case here and uh, then we will uh, go ahead with uh, our discussion. This first case is a uh, breast biopsy, I believe, uh, from a, uh, a, child, a woman in childbearing years. And uh, she developed a mass shortly after uh, delivery. And uh, this is uh, not something that uh, maybe is usually biopsy because we usually think of those years not as being high risk, but I think the patient was somewhat anxious about this new mass. And so uh, this lesion was uh, sampled. As you can see, it's very cellular. Uh, the cells are very closely uh, packed together and there are uh, some glandular type spaces that are filled with uh, a little bit of secretion uh, in between uh, the uh, other areas of fibrous septi and fat. So a little higher magnification gives away some of the features of these cells. And you can see that we have uh, quite a number of uh, vacuoles in the cytoplasm of these cells. Um, sometimes these vacuoles make the, the surface rather sort of uh, indistinct or, or, you know, just sort of the, the vacuoles sort of merge into the lumen. Uh, and that's because these are secretory vacuoles um, and that uh, these glands are, of course, uh, trying to make milk to provide uh, nutrients for the, for the newly born child. So this is an example of uh, what we call a lactating adenoma. Um, and sometimes these lesions uh, can persist after, uh, after lactation has ceased. So sometimes you will see these in a non-lactating breast uh, where they're just an isolated uh, area uh, of a few lobules together that will look like this. But in a larger mass lesion like this, uh, these changes are those of uh, a lactating breast and uh, therefore very benign uh, and not something that certainly warrants uh, surgery um, uh, or concern for uh, uh, adverse outcome later on. So I, I thought it would be interesting to share that case because we don't see uh, those kinds of uh, lesions very often, uh, fortunately, uh, and uh, the processes of uh, birth and, and uh, lactation proceed uh, in a healthy manner in most uh, women. So we'll go on to the next case. Uh, in contrast, uh, this also is a breast biopsy. Um, and uh, the the woman is fairly young in her 40s. Here we see again sort of a, a bluish uh, appearing tumor. And uh, 
as we come down, we see that this is actually not very cellular, uh, that there are just a few of the <clears throat> uh, islands of uh, cellular tissue here amidst this very blue uh, mucinous secretion. Um, so here we see the uh, cellular islands, not terribly atypical uh, in terms of pleomorphism, uh, just small nests of cells, fairly high NC ratio, however, uh, but generally low grade nuclei. Um, and so this is uh, no diagnostic challenge, but just a nice example of uh, mucinous uh, carcinoma, um, which is a separate category in the uh, WHO uh, system uh, uh, for breast uh, tumors and a nice illustration of this lesion. So you can see uh, this is certainly something that uh, can be diagnosed on FNA if you're fortunate enough to be able to aspirate some of the mucin and obtain a few of these cells. Uh, this is a lesion that can be uh, diagnosed in that manner. Uh, although doing uh, core biopsies is the norm in our setting um, so that we can do other markers as well, uh, this uh, would be amenable to diagnosis in other means. And the prognosis for this tumor is generally quite good uh, for a couple of reasons. One, because uh, the infiltration tends to be uh, defined by the presence of abundant mucin. And so therefore the mass is usually quite large relative to the amount of uh, cellularity uh, in the tumor. And so, uh, and, and also because of that, it's quite easily defined and therefore more easily resected. Um, because the uh, cellular tumor burden is low, uh, the uh, risk of metastases uh, tends to be lower. These tend to be discovered at a uh, relatively earlier stage, I guess you would say, than uh, many more conventional or more difficult uh, breast tumors like uh, lobular carcinoma uh, or conventional uh, ductal type carcinomas. Uh, generally, these tend to be uh, <clears throat> luminal A tumors, uh, therefore a good prognosis. They tend to be hormone positive um, and HER2 negative uh, in general as well. So all of those uh, things tend to point to a little bit better prognosis for this tumor. Um, and uh, so uh, that's, uh, that gets us through with that. Uh, let's see, we have uh, Kalyani uh, joining us here. Uh, we'll, um, Go on to the next case uh, now, <clears throat> which is I think one of the more challenging cases. And I uh, gave you a, a number of uh, immunohistochemical stains on this uh, tumor uh, because it is a, a more challenging uh, tumor to uh, deal with. So this is an ovarian mass in a uh, postmenopausal woman. And as you can see, it's quite cellular, uh, blue, uh, and has some cystic spaces with some bluish secretion, uh, which we can identify at lower magnification. So <clears throat> this came to us on a frozen section uh, initially, and uh, that was a challenging uh, frozen section, um, as you can imagine. And uh, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of my thinking as uh, we went through uh, this frozen section. So we, we saw and identified uh, the conventional glandular type of epithelium in this uh, tumor. Um, and a lot of this uh, epithelium looked a little bit, um, you know, kind of more columnar, much more like uh, you might think of for an endometrioid tumor. Uh, but the, uh, the thing that was uh, a little bit uh, disturbing was that we also had a little bit more of this trabecular pattern and areas where this uh, tumor had uh, sort of a more solid appearing growth factor that growth pattern that was not squamous. Um, and so we, you know, we wondered about uh, the possibility of sex cord stromal tumors. Uh, there's, there can be uh, endometrioid variants uh, of those tumors that can be difficult to uh, determine. Um, and, uh, and also, you know, as you look at this, you, you can see that uh, uh, although it's uh, certainly and clearly malignant tumor, 
Um, it's not an ultra high grade, so it's certainly not in the category of a high grade cirrus or a, uh, a poorly differentiated or highly aggressive uh, uh, Sertoli Leydig tumor or something in that sort of a, a category. So this was our challenge as we were looking at this on Frozen was kind of trying to figure out uh, where does this uh, where is this tumor going to sugar out? Uh, and I will do one other thing. I meant to enable a, um, transcript, so I will enable transcription for those who might want to see what I'm saying as well as hear what I'm saying. So. <clears throat> Then uh, with that sort of a differential, uh, sex cord stromal tumor, endometrioid tumor, um, other kinds of uh, <clears throat> epithelial neoplasms, uh, we began to do our uh, immunohistochemical workup. Um, and here you see more of this mixed glandular and stromal pattern um, where the stromal cells are also part of the uh, neoplasm. <clears throat> so um, I'll just run through these uh, stains. Um, uh, here is, uh, let's see which stain this was. This was our PAX-8 stain. And uh, so that's a very helpful stain um, in this situation because it says this is not a conventional endometrioid tumor. It's not a conventional serous carcinoma. Uh, it's not a clear cell tumor. It's none of those common epithelial tumors that we usually associate with uh, uh, ovarian neoplasms. <clears throat> now, there are some uh, ovarian tumors that will lose PAX-8. Uh, I'm thinking of dedifferentiated uh, carcinomas or undifferentiated carcinomas but this doesn't have the morphology uh, of that. So a negative PAX-8 sort of uh, rules out a number of uh, tumors. Um, here's a, uh, another stain, um, and we can see there's a little bit of positivity here. Um, I believe uh, this is a, uh, a pancytokeratin, uh, which shows some positivity uh, as you can see. So it certainly has some epithelial differentiation, but not as much as we might usually uh, assume. And whether this was CK7 or, or PAN-CK, I don't remember exactly. And we'll just check here, look at the controls tissue here. So this is a <clears throat> hormone receptor stain. I think you can see that it's uh, nicely staining. Well, let's just check. Let's just check here. I, I think I labeled these slides. So this is a progesterone receptor control. Okay, I was at least in the in the ballpark there. And as you can see, there's some positivity in this in the tumor. Um, so we've got some progesterone staining in some areas. And uh, we had this one area that was quite strong over here. So quite a bit of variability uh, in the progesterone receptor staining. And similarly with estrogen receptor, you can see the same uh, pattern, a little bit stronger here. Uh, oh, wait a second. We've got a control here that looks like Now, this is Vimentin, uh, I think. Yeah, Vimentin. So, um, so you see that it's Vimentin positive, and we would think of that as, you know, in some endometrioid tumors can be Vimentin positive, but we've already excluded uh, the Vimentin on the basis, or these endometrioid tumors on the basis of, of the uh, negative PAX-8. So um, also we see that most of the staining here is 
is in the stroma. There is some in the epithelium. And so this underscores the fact that uh, a number of tumors in addition to endometrioid tumors can have epithelial uh, cells staining with this uh, intermediate filament of bimentin. So here you see that nice positive staining within uh, the uh, uh, epithelial cell groups. And then uh, here we are looking at, uh, I think, some of our sex cord stromal markers. Um, this is, I think, WT1. Yes, that's our control for WT1. And it's uh, negative for that. So again, ruling, ruling out uh, the common epithelial tumors, the serous tumors. Um, and some of the other tumors that can be positive with WT1. Uh, negative in this case with uh, calretinin, another sex cord stromal marker. And that obviously is negative. So it's not fitting into the sex cord stromal tumor markers. It's not fitting into the common epithelial cell markers. Uh, it didn't have neuroendocrine markers. Um, and so where are we? We were, we were kind of stumped at this point. And then uh, we said, well, perhaps this is one of these adnexal tumors of Wolfian origin. Um, and we don't have the, the uh, critical stain to make that diagnosis. We had to send that off or to a reference laboratory. Uh, but the tumor did stain very strongly with androgen receptor. And so uh, based on that uh, finding, uh, we made a final diagnosis of uh, Wolfian tumor, of uh, <clears throat> an exal tumor of probable Wolfian origin. So uh, that was a, a very challenging case, so right from the, the, the frozen section point to uh, going through that algorithm of ruling out various uh, common epithelial tumors um, and also ruling out um, you know, the other uh, lesions that we would be concerned about uh, in that setting of uh, an older woman with a uh, adnexal mass. So Wolfian tumors can be uh, quite variable in their morphology. Uh, this is uh, one of the more cellular ones that I've seen. They're not very common, obviously. Um, I think over the past two or three years in our practice, we have had two. Um, and uh, that uh, is a, a fairly low incidence uh, of, uh, of these tumors. So we'll change gears um, and go on to, oh, let's see, I see there's some questions here in the chat. So let's pause for a second. Uh, okay, yes, it certainly is very, uh, very uncommon tumor and and uh, like you, Dr. Tu, I think I probably saw a few, but uh, misinterpreted them. Um, because if you don't have all of the stains and are thinking through things carefully, you, you can be just left with, uh, I'm not quite sure what this is sort of uh, uh, approach to things. So this next case is a uh, middle-aged woman who had um, uh, some anemia and uh, had the development of uh, some dys dyspepsia and came to endoscopy. And uh, at the time of endoscopy, she was noted to have uh, several little nodules in her stomach. And uh, these were resected using endoscopic mucosal resection. So you can see here, we have a, a cauterized margin and we have a nodule here. And the interesting thing about this nodule is it also has these uh, glandular uh, tissues associated with it. Um, and that uh, is quite interesting and a little bit of an odd variation on the architecture to have this sort of uh, glandular epithelium here within the tumor. So this is not a, a particularly uh, difficult diagnostic problem. This is clearly a neuroendocrine tumor with a intramucosal and submucosal component. It's a low grade, well differentiated uh, tumor, uh, grade one, if we were to do our rigorous uh, mitotic counts. Um, but the interesting thing is um, 
the backdrop in which this is occurring. So as we look at the uh, adjacent, more normal uh, mucosa, we note that there's a fair bit of inflammation. And uh, although this was taken from the body of the uh, stomach, we don't see um, normal body type mucosa. Um, and in fact, as we look uh, here at some of these areas, we can see that we actually have um, sort of more almost intestinal type of uh, mucosa with uh, some goblet cells uh, or pseudo goblets developing in areas here. Uh, additionally, in this tissue that's down here uh, inside the tumor, we have a uh, uh, intestinal metaplastic uh, tissue. We have goblet cells here as well. Now, um, I, uh, this is a patient who has um, atrophic chronic gastritis. Here we see more of this intestinal metaplasia. Um, and so she has an autoimmune process uh, with um, the development of secondary anemia due to loss of uh, B12 absorptive capability and intrinsic factor with uh, damage to her uh, um, gastric mucosa. But the thing that I find uh, to be quite interesting here is this feature here. Um, and so, um, because this type of columnar mucosa should not occur uh, deep to the uh, muscularis mucosa, which this obviously is. And so uh, I'm wondering if this is um, actually a part of the neoplasm. Um, and what I would posit as a hypothesis is that, that this is, in essence, a mixed uh, neuroendocrine, non-neuroendocrine tumor in its earliest uh, phase. <clears throat> Essentially, we have the neuroendocrine feature being neoplastic, but the non-neuroendocrine uh, piece is just metaplastic or still metaplastic and not yet neoplastic. Um, so I don't know if that's true, but we do know that there are mixed uh, neuroendocrine and non-neuroendocrine tumors. Um, and this is certainly an example of that, certainly in the most benign phase uh, of that sort of disorder, uh, to have this admixture of metaplastic intestinal type epithelium with an admixed um, neuroendocrine tumor. So uh, that's uh, just a, a little bit of an interesting uh, sidelight to the process. Now, I know in Asia that uh, you, you don't tend to see a lot of uh, atrophic chronic gastritis um, and, uh, and so forth, but so I thought this would be a nice example for you to also uh, see some of the uh, changes that we see with that disorder uh, in generally. Of course, if we were to do a, a synaptophysin or other neuroendocrine marker, in addition to these uh, tumor cells being nicely positive, uh, we could identify in many instances some degree of endocrine cell hyperplasia occurring in the uh, background uh, mucosa as well. Um, and sometimes that may be some of these cells uh, that are really hyperplastic endocrine cells uh, along the sides and, and so forth of the uh, normal crypts. Okay, well, let's go on to the next slide. Uh, I've given you kind of my uh, wildest thoughts of the day. Uh, this is a more mundane specimen, an endometrial curatage. And uh, of course, we see there's lots of blood in this sample. And usually this is a sample that was taken for dysfunctional or abnormal uterine bleeding. Um, and uh, the woman was not in a high risk category. She was not obese or um, had not been taking uh, uh, hormone supplements or anything of that sort. Um, but uh, as I evaluate these things, I, I look first to, for kind of how much tissue we've got, and I look for clues that may, you know, give me a, a suggestion as to the phase of the, of, the, uh, of, of the cycle that they're in. And one of those clues that I usually pick up on very early is the presence of these very small um, balls of stromal cells with associated uh, epithelium draped over them. 
that sort of says this is a, a sort of a menstrual phase endometrium. And then if we also happen to catch a little fibrin thrombi like that, you know, that's further evidence that uh, we have um, a menstrual or a breakdown process going on that's, uh, that's morphologically confirming the fact that uh, this patient has um, uh, abnormal bleeding. Now, what's uh, interesting is this stuff here as well. So in addition to having this more typical menstrual type of uh, product, we also see here um, some additional epithelium that has this very abundant eosinophilic cytoplasm. Now, I tell my residents that they should really be very careful to not diagnose um, hyperplasia anytime they're seeing this kind of uh, menstrual pattern. And so although some people might look at this and go, oh, this is, this is maybe hyperplasia or intraepithelial neoplasia, uh, I would back away from that and think about other possibilities. Uh, in fact, what, uh, what can occur is what's called eosinophilic metaplasia, uh, which is a perfectly benign uh, entity, um, but that can be seen in, a, in these uh, women who have uh, altered uh, bleeding situations. Um, you might be tempted to think about an eosinophilic variant of clear cell carcinoma, uh, given the very uh, sort of apical nuclei in a few of these sections like here. Um, but uh, in that situation, I think uh, you want to make sure that you're going to see high-grade um, epithelial, or excuse me, nuclear atypia. Here's another area where you might think about clear cell carcinoma. But notice here that these cells, the nuclei, are all very low grade. They're very small nuclei, and they're not uh, forming any degree of uh, significant atypia. So this is sort of a combined uh, clear cell and eosinophilic metaplasia. Now, a fragment like this, I think, could raise consideration for um, hyperplasia. Um, and so that does become a consideration in this situation, uh, even though we have these other more typical menstrual changes as well. Uh, so I would probably describe this and uh, suggest follow-up uh, in this circumstance. Uh, but I think the, the major changes are the menstrual pattern, the eosinophilic metaplasia, um, and this little clear cell change area, uh, which uh, might represent uh, 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 hyperplasia um, and warrant some follow-up, perhaps a repeat curatage at a later date. Here's another area of this over here, where you can see that we do have a little bit of uh, more closely spaced glands uh, in this situation. Now, these types of metaplasias can occur in polyps as well uh, as in the endometrium proper. Uh, and here we can see a little bit more of this continuum from the, uh, the eosinophilic metaplasia to the clear cell change. So um, this is uh, what I believe is an, an eosinophilic and, and clear cell metaplasia, but does uh, raise possible concern for follow-up because of the consideration of more closely spaced glands that could represent hyperplasia. So I usually would sign this out with a bit of a comment or a note uh, that would be more explicit in recommending what follow-up I thought would be more most useful to uh, clarify this issue. Okay, so uh, going on to uh, another uh, GI case. Uh, this is a patient who had a, uh, an esophageal resection for another purpose, and uh, this uh, illustrated uh, one of the uh, common features that we sometimes see uh, in uh, the GI tract, which is the presence of uh, uh, ectopic um, tissue that doesn't belong where it, where it is. So this is uh, from the upper esophagus. <clears throat> and here we see um, little clusters of glandular mucosa here. Um, 
which you might say, well, this could be, you know, intestinal metaplasia, and sure enough, it is. Uh, we see this in the uh, uh, deeper tissues. So this could be a situation where this patient had been, um, had an attempted ablation of Barrett's esophagus, and essentially we buried um, the Barrett's epithelium because we didn't burn quite deep enough with that ablation procedure. And so the surface epithelium reconstituted over uh, this metaplastic epithelium. But as we uh, went further up in this specimen, and here's another area of that uh, buried Barrett's, um, we come to an area that looks like this, um, which we have a little bit of Barrett's here, uh, but here we have uh, more gastric type of mucosa. So we have foveolar cells and antral type of uh, glands here. Uh, so <clears throat> usually in an inlet patch, uh, and this is towards the upper end of the esophagus, usually in an inlet patch, you're going to have um, gastric body type of mucosa. So acid secreting uh, mucosa rather than antral type mucosa. So uh, I think uh, that is a very interesting finding in this situation that here high in the esophagus, we have uh, a more um, antral type of mucosa in addition to some Barrett's intestinal metaplasia. And that raised consideration as to whether or not this was truly an inlet patch or whether this was uh, um, more characteristically a Barrett's type of uh, metaplasia uh, with gastric uh, antral type metaplasia and then intestinal metaplasia uh, as well. Um, so uh, that's an interesting uh, dis description of some of the things that we see. Here's a little bit more of uh, this type of mucosa here. And again, you can see this metaplastic uh, change with gastric um, antral type of uh, glands here. So, uh, and then let's go down here, another patch of uh, gastric type mucosa, again with antral rather than uh, uh, body or fundus type of mucosa. So I don't know if there may have been something unique in this patient's uh, uh, biological uh, backdrop uh, that uh, uh, created a more uh, uh, gastric uh, antral type of metaplasia uh, situation. All right, any questions to this point? Let's see, I seem, see uh, <clears throat> Kalyani is correctly gauged that I'm, I'm predicting that it was sort of a mixed uh, endocrine, neuroendocrine or uh, non-neuroendocrine uh, tumor on that uh, stomach. So that would be correct. That was my assumption. Okay, well, let's move a little bit further up into the neck. Uh, here is a nice uh, resection of a thyroid nodule uh, from a 45-year-old uh, woman who's had this nodule for some time. And uh, as you can see, it's very, very blue. Um, or maybe more purple, I guess. It's got some cytoplasm to it. And as we look at this uh, tumor at low magnification, we're not seeing any of the normal uh, follicular type of architecture. Rather, we're seeing sort of uh, cords and streaming uh, uh, trabeculae of uh, more solid tumor. It is somewhat uh, encapsulated. Um, and we may be able to see a little bit of a little bit of peripheral uh, thyroid tissue here, as you can see, a little bit of follicular tissue that is being compressed uh, by the uh, um, the lesion. As we come into higher magnification on this uh, tumor, uh, you can see that there is a fairly uniform uh, nuclear size and shape, one cell to another. And uh, 
there's a bit of a coarsening to the chromatin, a few uh, macro or micronucleoli, a sort of a salt and pepper appearance here. Um, so uh, looking at this tumor, <clears throat> I think we would wonder about the possibility of a medullary tumor. Uh, it doesn't look like uh, any of our well-differentiated uh, uh, thyroid neoplasms, except that the cells are really quite uh, low grade appearing. Uh, but this solid pattern of growth um, in this situation is, uh, uh, is concerning. Um, we see a little bit maybe suggestion here and there of a little bit of residual follicular or a little bit of follicular type differentiation, these small spaces with a little bit of pink secretion that uh, could be uh, follicular thyroid type of uh, uh, differentiation. Now in some areas here, and I, and I think you need to look at different areas, you see a bit of uh, nuclear clearing um, and some sort of orphan antii type of appearance that we might associate with um, papillary carcinoma, but this is clearly not uh, papillary carcinoma. So this is the entity that uh, is referred to as poorly differentiated uh, thyroid carcinoma, uh, which in some uh, uh, circles is thought to be essentially a, uh, a, a step beyond um, or differentiated poorly differentiated from a pre-existing well-differentiated tumor, because sometimes you can get this type of architecture in these tumors in one area, whereas in other areas you'll have uh, a remnant or a residual area of a uh, well-differentiated uh, thyroid neoplasm, either follicular or uh, papillary. Um, and the molecular uh, story in these tumors uh, tends to reflect that, in that uh, if they have, they may either have RAS mutations along with other mutations, or they'll have uh, the BRAF mutations uh, or other mutations associated with uh, papillary carcinoma, in addition to an increased number of uh, P53 mutations or other uh, uh, molecular events that would indicate that there may have been an accumulation of uh, molecular alterations. So I think of this as a sort of a progressed stage from a better differentiated uh, uh, thyroid neoplasm uh, that uh, because it's accumulating more um, uh, molecular alterations has a, uh, a different architecture and so forth with that backdrop of a, a well-differentiated tumor uh, often someplace uh, in its uh, past history. It's important to recognize this lesion to not classify it as a medullary tumor or as some other type of tumor, uh, because uh, many of these will still respond to radioiodine treatment. Uh, many of them will still respond to other targeted therapies based on the molecular drivers uh, in this tumor. Okay, uh, we'll keep moving on to our next case. staying in the uh, thyroid here. Um, as you can see, we have uh, thyroid parenchyma here. And uh, here's our uh, two lesions. One is a nicely, uh, easily identifiable macro uh, follicular nodule, uh, not much of a capsule. Um, and then our other lesion here uh, is this more solid tumor, which as we come into, we see here does have a capsule, and clearly uh, we can see here that it has extension beyond the capsule. So we're not seeing the actual break in the capsule in this particular section, but we can see that we have tumor beyond the capsule and tumor within the capsule. And uh, that should, uh, and here's another example here where we can see tumor outside the capsule. So this puts us uh, right immediately in the uh, minimally invasive uh, category of uh, thyroid carcinomas, even without identifying you know, the cell type or other sorts of uh, issues. Um, 
So uh, with that in mind, that we're going to be calling this a minimally invasive thyroid carcinoma or carcinoma, uh, we then can, can turn our attention to uh, what kind of tumor this uh, is and where it, it fits. We don't see the conventional uh, follicular structures. Um, and sometimes in micro uh, nodular uh, follicular tumors, you, can, you will not see uh, macro follicles, of course. Uh, but the thing that stands out here is this quite abundant uh, cytoplasm. And uh, some of this, as we can see here, is rather granular. Um, the nuclei, again, are well differentiated. This is one of the differentiated thyroid neoplasms. And uh, <clears throat> we have nice round nuclei, uh, not much in the way of uh, features of papillary carcinoma. And, and these cells, I think, generally would fit into the category of a Herthel cell uh, type of uh, morphology with a fairly abundant uh, oxyphilic cytoplasm and round, quite uniform nuclei. So uh, with that, we've kind of uh, hit on the uh, key features to identify in this lesion, uh, the presence of capsular invasion, uh, the presence of a uh, uh, differentiated uh, thyroid uh, morphology, a Herthel cell, and uh, we can therefore uh, qualify this as a uh, uh, minimally invasive uh, Herthel cell carcinoma. Now, obviously, finding uh, this sort of capsular invasion um, is not, should not be just based on luck. And if we have to rely on luck, we're probably not relying on very uh, reproducible uh, variable. So in this situation, we again emphasize the importance of submitting the entire nodule so that we can examine as much as possible of the capsule uh, microscopically to identify uh, these uh, types of small microscopic foci of invasion, uh, because that's going to impact the prognosis and uh, follow up and potentially even current treatment. Okay, well, I think we've got uh, one or two more cases we can get through here in the next few minutes. Um, <clears throat> this is a, uh, moving back to the GI tract, this is a nodule that was <clears throat> found uh, in the rectum and uh, sort of a polyp uh, type lesion. And of course, uh, that's fairly close at hand with anoscopy, they were able to uh, resect this lesion. And uh, as you can see, we've got some central uh, dilated vessels that are sort of pulled up into this uh, nodule. Uh, we have a variable uh, pattern to the uh, structure of this that looks as though we have uh, quite a lot of vasculature, sort of a granulation tissue type of uh, vessels here. And uh, we have a uh, eroded uh, ulcerated surface. So in fact, as we look at this, <clears throat> almost the entire structure is granulation tissue. Uh, so it's a very, um, uh, proliferative uh, granulation tissue type of appearance uh, with these vessels pulled into the, uh, to the process. And here we can see some of these vessels mixed uh, arterioles and venules uh, and ectatic vessels extending up into this with an ulcerated surface. Only very focally here do we identify uh, a little bit of uh, rectal mucosa here, as we see here. Um, and this is actually fairly important uh, clue because as we look at this uh, tissue here, uh, you can see that these are not normally structured glands. Uh, these are somewhat branched and uh, their, their uh, architecture is disturbed. And that's a clue to what's causing this uh, ulceration and uh, granulation tissue. Uh, these glands are getting pulled and uh, distorted uh, mechanically uh, to produce this kind of architectural repair and, uh, and distortion uh, to them. So uh, this pattern, this appearance of polypoid granulation tissue with associated uh, 
glandular distortion is uh, quite characteristic of the solitary rectal ulcer syndrome. Um, and uh, it's important to recognize this because uh, if you just call this granulation tissue and you don't alert them to the possibility that this is a prolapse related phenomenon where the mucosa is prolapsing and getting distorted and thus uh, leading to this ulceration and proliferative pyogenic granuloma essentially in the uh, rectum, uh, they may not be alerted to the fact that this patient is getting uh, repeated episodes of prolapse that are causing this uh, uh, syndrome. So uh, this is, although this is, you know, classic granulation tissue, um, and that sort of a diagnosis would be entirely uh, appropriate, um, the fact that we have these uh, architecturally altered glands uh, indicating that there's been that there's been torsion or there's been pulling and uh, distortion on the uh, mucosa mechanically, we can make the diagnosis of a polypoid granulation secondary to solitary rectal ulcer syndrome, uh, or at least suggest the possibility that there is a prolapse uh, phenomenon going on that is the underlying cause of this. Now, uh, in fact, this, uh, this syndrome or this problem is uh, quite widespread. Um, and I base that just on the fact that Google searches for you know, rectal prolapse, solitary rectal ulcer, et cetera, et cetera, uh, are uh, quite uh, prevalent. And uh, that would indicate that uh, a number of people are out there trying to look for ways of relief and understanding of their disorder. Okay, well, the last case of the day uh, comes from the thorax. And uh, this patient presented with a unilateral um, uh, pleural effusion and some pleural thickening, um, and uh, that tissue was biopsied. So here we see uh, this uh, thickened uh, pleura and uh, the underlying soft tissue. Uh, and as you can see, we've got on the surface here sort of a, uh, a spindly uh, proliferation here, which is quite cellular. We have a little bit of uh, a surface, uh, maybe a fibrin or something of that sort, but we have this fairly cellular spindle-shaped stromal component here. Um, and as we look at this component, you can see that there's a bit of a tipia here, uh, probably some mitotic activity, uh, variability in terms of the nuclear size and shape. In addition to this feature, which we see here, adjacent to this here, we see um, these slit-like spaces lined by um, epithelial type cells um, that have, again, a degree of pleomorphism and atypia. Now, of course, we know that mesothelial cells can be atypical in a reactive state uh, as well. Um, and so sometimes the differentiation between uh, malignant and uh, benign uh, mesothelial proliferations are a challenge. Um, in this situation, however, uh, here we're seeing the, this mesothelial proliferation. It's very papillary. Um, and it appears almost to have a, an infiltrative uh, pattern. Um, at least it's, it's certainly getting close to here to the fatty tissues uh, of the uh, uh, chest wall. But in this situation, we have uh, two components, which is quite helpful. We have this spindle cell component here on one aspect, and we have this epithelioid component here elsewhere, uh, which indicate that there's a, a degree of proliferation. Now, I have seen a number of very florid mesothelial hyperplasias in my life, but I don't think that this degree uh, is, this is usually beyond what you usually would get with a benign papillary mesothelial proliferation. Additionally, you'll notice how it's, it's making these sort of onion-skinned uh, nodules, uh, which I think uh, is quite nice 
uh, indication that the stromal element is a piece of this as well. Now, one thing to think about with regard to benign mesothelial proliferations uh, is that there also tends to be kind of a granulation tissue pattern with those in which you'll get kind of perpendicular appearing uh, vessels to the surface. And we're not seeing that here. Um, in addition to seeing this uh, spindle shape uh, component to the tumor as well. So this is a really nice example of a biphasic uh, mesothelioma with a combined epithelial and uh, spindle cell proliferation uh, in this patient uh, that would account for uh, mesothelioma. Uh, mesotheliomas still occur. Um, there are still situations and circumstances where exposure to um, asbestos has occurred, um, either in childhood or other settings um, that can be uh, set up and a pre predisposing risk factor for the patients to develop uh, this, uh, this case. Well, so I, I see that that was not a mystery to any of you. You did really well. Uh, We'll, we've got uh, a minute or two for questions, if uh, anyone wants to uh, bring forward a question on any of the cases. You can type those in or unmute yourself and, uh, and uh, uh, raise your question. Uh, so Dr. Tu asks, uh, in this case of mesothelioma, should you do immunohistochemistry? Do you need to do immunohistochemistry to confirm the, the diagnosis? And um, I think it depends a little bit on the setting and the clinical presentation. Um, but because the, the diagnosis of mesothelioma is such a, a dire prognosis, I think most people would do some immunohistochemistries to rule out a... Uh, carcinoma with uh, sarcomatous uh, features. Um, so uh, doing some mesothelial marker, uh, ruling out uh, the more typical uh, epithelial tumors that can occur in the chest and, and the lung uh, would be doing the patient a favor uh, because uh, obviously there are more targeted therapies for some of the you know, defined adenocarcinomas or squamous carcinomas of the, uh, of the thorax. Well, I have some very good news with regard to our session next month. Uh, we're going to have another guest professor uh, who is Dr. Laura Adhikari. She trained at the Mayo Clinic and uh, at WashU in St. Louis uh, in cytology and has done GU pathology as well as helping me with some of the GYN cases. And so she will be our guest uh, next month um, in January. So I uh, look forward to that. And uh, thank you so much for, uh, for joining us. Uh, oh, good question, uh, Kalyani. If you find gastric antral metaplasia in a biopsy, um, that's a very interesting question because that's, uh, it's not a risk factor for um, neoplasia or acid production. So uh, you're not going to have the uh, the secondary complications of you know, ulceration and that sort of thing. Um, but I think it, in that situation, I would look to make sure that we didn't have uh, adjacent or associated um, intestinal metaplasia that had also occurred, which would imply a higher risk factor. I, I believe our session is recorded and we will post the, the session afterwards. Um, so thanks so much for joining us and Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays. Uh, 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 <clears throat> Happy New Year, et cetera, et cetera, to, to all of you. Thank you so much. And we will see you again.